I think my biggest breakthrough as an evolution biologist was when I learned that the Soviet Union was teaching evolution biology through the work of Kropotkin, whose major book was Mutual Aid and was all about cooperation in nature, while the West was being taught the Darwinian struggle for survival, hostile competition, get, make it to the top of the pile kind of evolution biology. And what I saw in nature was both that kind of hostile competition and the cooperation. And so I worked for a long time on how, how to put those two together until it dawned on me that we had here a maturation cycle, that Darwin was talking about the first part, the youthful part. And when there's huge creativity along with all the hostility. So um, in fact, biologists know ecosystems by the designations pioneer and climax, type ones and type three ecosystems. And they'll tell you that the species in a type one ecosystem are feisty, competitive, take all the territory they can, all the resources they can, uh, multiply as fast as possible and bump off their enemies. While in a type three climax ecosystem, you see the species tightly interwoven, feeding each other, um, sharing territory and resources in very cooperative ways. Now, when you're a Western scientist and you don't believe consciousness is primary and you see it all as accident, non-intelligent, you can't see a learning curve because nature presumably can't learn, it's not intelligent. But when you have a worldview that's rooted in consciousness, in aliveness, in intelligence, you see that the young species eventually get it that feeding your enemy is more energy efficient, cheaper, than killing them. And those species are the ones that survive for a long haul because they become mature and cooperative and build these wonderful ecosystems like rainforests and prairies and coral reefs where everything is feeding everything else. And even the predator-prey relationship that they're so fond of showing you on television as blood and gore are, are cooperative systems in which the job of the prey species is to pick off only the unhealthiest, the slowest, the ones that can't run so fast, which improves the species, the, 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 the predators, I mean, have that job. The prey is getting stronger by running harder, right? So the predator-prey relationship is something that stays in balance. If the predators eat too many, then they'll start to die off because there won't be enough food, and so the thing constantly rebalances itself. And so in my evolutionary theory, I see this maturation curve. Now, we don't kill off adolescents if we want grown-ups, right? It's just as valuable to be young as it is to be older. So we need both of these things. And capitalism is a clear case of a juvenile mode of economics. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory sense, but only to know that it will outlive its, its usefulness and that it has to collapse to give way to the more mature mode of cooperating. So we're very afraid in the United States of socialism, you know, Obama is a socialist and stuff. What do you mean by socialism? Friendly, cooperative societies? Is that so scary? Um, <laughs> might it not be better than severe exploitation using a money system that was designed to concentrate wealth in few hands? Well, what's the process of globalization? To me, it's exactly that evolutionary maturation process where we are moving into increasing levels of cooperation. Now, the juvenile mode wants to protect itself. It's still feisty. It liked that banking system that concentrates the wealth. But if you look at your body, which has 50 trillion cells, each of which is as complex as a large human city, and see that its economics are in the mature cooperative mode, wow, what's happening? In each of our cells, there are about a thousand mitochondria, which were once free living bacteria billions of years ago, who learned that maturation. And, and while they had developed many lifestyles in the immature mode, they put them to use in a division of labor, forming the only other kind of cell ever to evolve on this planet the nucleated cells that you and I are made of are bacterial colonies. 
So the descendants of those ancient free-living bacteria in our cells, the ones called mitochondria, are the bankers. What do they do? 24-7, they're giving out free stored value debit cards, which you take and you spend into the cellular economy, and when you've spent it, you take it back to the bank. You never pay it back, much less interest. You get a new, new line on your card. Fantastic, isn't it? The bank's job is just to regulate how much currency needs to be circulating. But there's no reason for money to be scarce. There's no reason to have poverty and wealth in huge, massively different uh, proportions. If we followed nature, if we had a real science of economics, which we don't, because our economics are based on, on poor observations of human psychology. The Darwinian notion that everyone must only be self-interested and competitive, right? Juvenile mode. Now in the world, we have over a million NGOs. Paul Hawkins' book has, has really documented this. Those NGOs are trying to make a better world, and they're communicating with each other through the internet. The internet is the biggest self-organizing living system on the planet, and it's very prone to gifting economies, to cooperation, right? It's hard to exploit it. It's hard to control it. Nobody's able to. It's a true maturing living system. Sure, it's doing all the pornography and now all the, the marketing and things like that, but in its essence, it's a self-organizing living system that I think is helping us to move into the mature mode as a species. So. We're having all these crises now, the banking crisis, the oil crisis, the aging population crisis, you name it, there's a crisis. Nature doesn't fix what isn't broken. It is profoundly conservative with things that work well and radically creative when things don't work. And my hope for the human species comes with, first of all, let's get our oneness. If we get our oneness, it's much easier to move into the cooperative mode. You get rid of enemies. You discern the plot of the human drama without judging it. And so you're in a much better mood for talking to enemies and resolving problems. So I, I have a lot of hope for where we're going. The religions are cooperating. The arts are cooperating. The sciences are cooperating. We have international space stations. We can trade money around all languages and cultures and money systems. We're building European unions and United States is, and you know, we're practicing cooperation, but it has to move to a global level now. So if we wake up, if we know our oneness, if we see the maturation curve in biology, so that we're putting together the keyboard of the physics universe of vibrations and the biology of maturation and the economics of our living bodies then we'll see everything that we can do to revise our world into a mature mode. And I like to say to young people, you know, you want to be a techie instead of an organic farmer? That's okay. Just don't put any toxins in it. Make it fully recyclable, just the way nature made you, without toxins and recyclable. Gave you this body, right? You can move on afterwards into another incarnation, but follow it for now. Ground cosmic love all the way down to your toes. That's what you're here for. You know, that's, if we can live that, we could have, we could make paradise of Earth. Probably we won't, because I think there will always be souls incarnating who need to learn, who need to grow up, who need to go through the maturation process. But maybe at least we could have enough basic cultures here who had grown up so that we could have multiple sciences and give each other space for our individual realities as well as our different cultural realities and use that diversity without which nature cannot be creative in positive, friendly ways. <laughs>